I, uh, I'm going to be up here a bunch today, so hopefully you don't get sick of me. Uh, now I feel like we should just dive right in. Uh, I, I hate to bring up the M word so early in the morning, but it's sort of an elephant in the room when we talk about this topic of, of recruiting and getting sort of the next generation of, of uh, federal workers um, into these jobs. So millennials, and be careful what you say because I'm one of these elephants. Uh, <laughs> uh, how, how do you, what, what initiatives um, are you seeing at, at your agencies to um, recruit uh, young people and, and get fresh faces in the door. Um, uh, Darcy, you want to start, start us off? Sure. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, you know, I think it is a challenge for us to reach out to millennials. Um, you know, I'm not sure they have the same vision of the federal government that some people had in the past, the previous generations. You know, we don't necessarily have the reputation of being as stable and of having sort of some of the more innovative jobs. Um, and so I think it is a challenge, and, and our pay obviously is, is pretty set, so we can't um, really help them. But I think what we're trying to do is really recruit based on what we do, the mission that we have, um, the fact that we're serving the public. For my organization, we're a technical organization. We serve data sets to the public uh, for people to do whatever they want with. That, that helps uh, science, that helps private sector, that helps other government agencies. And we're trying to sort of really capture and um, build off of, of that mission. And you know, we do a lot of recruitment at uh, school fairs, particularly here in Denver. We also have an office in Missouri where we do a lot of recruitment to try to get them to understand what it means to be in the government. You know, we try to, to give them sort of that work-life balance where they have a lot of ability to get training, to grow as a professional. Um, and that's something that we really target with them is that, you know, it's not just what they do, but how they do it, who they're doing it for. Um, and so far, we've been successful in, in getting a lot of students, at least, and students that want to stay with us. Uh, and Kat, what about you? What do, I know you have some interesting uh, initiatives. Interesting. Yeah. interesting. So, uh, so I work for the Department of the Air Force Civilian Service. And uh, if many of you under, know, we have a centralized uh, personnel center down in San Antonio, Texas. And they help. Uh, do HR for the entire Air Force. Uh, so one of the teams down there is our talent acquisition team. And if any of you have been at job fairs, and I'll give you an example for us. So the military departments, we had the big AF Air Force behind us, the blue and white. And a lot of times the millennials, we'll go ahead and use the word, uh, will walk by. Um, they see Air Force and they think they, we're there to recruit them to put on the uniform and serve our country. Well, what they don't realize is that you can also serve our country as a civilian um, uh, within the Air Force and the other military departments as well. So, uh, so this talent acquisition team, part of their mission is to also uh, work on branding and marketing for the Air Force, um, and specifically uh, the Air Force Civilian Service, and encourage those students to you know, come and serve um, as, as a civilian for the military departments. So it is kind of, now that we are doing that, we're starting to see more connections with those students and uh, college students, um, young professionals, uh, and there's more dialogue to try to bring those skill sets into, um, into the military department. So that's one of the challenges that we've had um, uh, with our branding and marketing to, to try to attract those folks. Right. Um, and Justin, I'll come to you in just a second, but mm -hmm. I just wanted to hear from, from, based on what you said, how important is it to sort of go out and, and be on their turf and you know, go to their schools or you know, job fairs that they're coming, rather than just sort of passively waiting back for the applications to come in. Very important. Yeah. So our talent acquisition team as well um, actually makes those connections uh, through, yes, job fairs, but actually goes out in regular contact, social media. We have Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, I, that's only a few. I'm sure there's probably five or six more, six more that I'm, I'm not thinking of. Um, but to connect with them on, again, through, through how they connect with each mm -hmm. other, through social media, right. um, and um, dispelling some of the myths as well. Um, but it is very important to be on their turf and bring them, um, bring them the information that they need, that they uh, connect with. Yeah, if I can add to that, I think 
What we've tried to do is explain to them how the government application process works. So we have a little one pager that really explains how to apply through USA Jobs because that's essential, right? We can't hire people out that, without that. But if you're not familiar with it and you're not a government you know, seasoned employee, that can be pretty intimidating. So get out there, get to the schools, really give them that opportunity to understand how to apply, what it means, what the terminology is, the mistakes that most of them make and don't ever make it in. So we definitely focus on that yeah. as well. If I could add one thing. Um, Go ahead. One thing to reinforce, I think, is to um, really sell the mission of the agency. And so, you know, these, these folks coming out of grad school, they don't necessarily know what these agencies do, um, but they're all important missions. But, you know, sometimes in government, we don't do a good enough job of really marketing ourselves. And the millennials want to be part of something that they believe in, right? That's just as important as money to them. And so you really have to sell that part. And, and we do that through uh, partnering with um, the uh, grad schools, grad students doing their capstone projects. Um, they come in on a non-paid, non sort of like an internship. Um, we can see if, if they, they're passionate about the work. They can see if they like the work for us. So we can get some folks in the door here and there. Um, without going through that full application process, USA Jobs and those things. And we found um, you know, both ways, people that have come in and, and then we've retained or, 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 not, or those that have come in and said, you know, really looking to do something different. But now I know that this is what you guys do, so. Right, and you know, that can be important too, get sort of weeding out people who realize that this is not for them, rather right. than going through the, as we all know, lengthy process of getting, right. that, or can be lengthy process of getting someone on board and then you realize, then they realize at that point, and everyone sort of wait, has wasted a lot of their time. Um, so Justin, uh, once you actually get people in the door, um, then you have a new challenge of, of getting them to stay. You know, uh, uh, Darcy, you, you mentioned how the, the newer, younger workforce, they're not what we're used to. They're not necessarily saying, I'm going to join the government and stay there for 30 years and then retire. You know, they, they, we like to bounce around sometimes. So, <laughs> How do you get, what, what sort of strategies have you found um, as far as, you know, getting them actually to stay? Well, I think um, the main thing we look at is engagement, engagement with our new employees, really um, high touch, uh, high communication because um, they, they, you know, they really want a lot of you know, constant feedback, knowing how they're doing, how they can improve. Um, and and if that's important early in your career when you're coming on board because you don't know what the expectations are necessarily. So we do that high touch, try to get them involved in um, conversations that may be slightly above where they're at, but they're able to sit at the table and listen. And um, you know, fresh, fresh ears you know, have some good ideas. And so if they feel like they have some buy-in from the management that you know, my opinion matters, uh, you know, that's, that's a really uh, strong way to, to get them engaged and to say, OK, this is some place I want to be. Um, so we try to do that as much as possible. Great. Um, uh, so, Justin mentioned the you know sort of internship program that they have, um, and I think uh, you guys had a little bit of experience with Pathways or other programs. So, could you talk a little bit about um, what you've um, tried to do and if that's been effective? Mm -hmm. So, uh, Pathways, and that's across a lot of the federal agencies right. have that program, um, uh, and Air Force does have that program, a pretty robust program. So once you get them in the door, and sometimes that may include student loan repayment, which is important, um, but once you get them in the door, um, the, the internship program, you are paired with a mentor, someone uh, usually in a leadership role that will help that student um, be engaged in the, in the organization, um, be heard as well. Um, and then as they go through that and complete their program, there's an established program where they might get a little bit uh, I'll give an example. So an HR intern um, may do classification, staffing, uh, benefits, um, uh, employee relations, labor relations. And so they get a little bit of each. And then they might fall into um, one particular area. I'm a product of that. I am an intern uh, on, a, on the old program. Um, but I had a little bit of everything. Um, I fell more into the staffing career field. And that's kind of where my, my uh, career has taken. Uh, we found that when you do pair them up and mentor them mm -hmm. um, and allow this program where they get a little bit of a taste of everything, um, they tend to stay longer. They also tend to promote. 
and you start seeing a lot of uh, interns who are now in middle management or in leadership roles and then therefore they turn around and support the program themselves. So, uh, so I think that kind of engagement really just creates a cycle of bringing in the fresh skills and then developing them and then keeping them, retaining them on board. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we're, we've been very successful with Pathways as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, we've had a, quite a few that really have wanted to stay. We don't probably move them around as much as it sounds like you guys are. Um, they tend to, you know, work in a certain group and um, on certain skills, and, and they really enjoy that. Um, but what we haven't figured out is how long they're going to stay, right? So we might convert them to permanent. Uh, we've had probably 30 Pathway students that we've converted to permanent in the past three years. Um, because we had a huge gap in our workforce and, and needed some new skills and fresh faces, but we just don't know how long they're going to stay and how long that investment is going to happen. So we've got to figure out mm -hmm. how to keep them, right? So we've got really great talent in, in the door, but how do we keep them? And I think that's where we're struggling. Um, uh, Justin, do you uh, have any thoughts on, on that as, in terms of uh, you know, teaching? I, I, we had briefly discussed how uh, teaching young employees or even people who are mid-career, sort of getting them new skills and uh, that might help um, uh, sort of re reinvigorate their passion and for, the, for the job. Do you have any thoughts yeah, on that? Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's a good question because you have these, um, these folks that are coming in the door that are very enthusiastic about what they're doing. And then, you know, you have folks that have been in the job 10, 10 15, 20 years who just stay in their lane. And, and so you have a, a dynamic there. And so to, to do more office-wide engagement, whether it's trainings or different types of events where everybody you know, can ex have the same experience together, I think is important. Um, you know, and it gets those, like you said, mid-career mid folks, gets them some new skills. Um, and so we've engaged in, in sort of a regular um, cycle of those types of trainings. Um, and that's sort of brought together sort of those the two different uh, you know types of groups that we have in the office, mm -hmm. um, and whether they be you know subject matter trainings or doing you know the different personality tests to figure out how folks work together, um, it, it sort of runs the gamut. But it's getting that whole office or that whole group together to to work on um, issues together and work through problems that aren't necessarily related to your everyday work and what you have to do. And if I could add to that, sure. we one thing we've done probably in the past three years is have, um, we created a leadership development plan for all of our staff, not just millennials, not just our, our younger professionals, but, and we've put aside some funding every year so that people cannot, can really focus on the leadership skills and those soft skills that don't always get the funding, don't always go in the budget right away, because it's not technical, it's, it's not something that's required to do their job, it's, in some ways, it's more essential to do their job, but it's not something that most people focus on. So we've had a lot of our younger professionals and newer staff really latch onto that more than our seasoned uh, federal employees uh, because it just gives them some ability to learn something different and really sort of get those interpersonal skills. So that's really been successful for us. One, one thing to add to that. So, um, you know, we do those uh, development plans too, um, but it's important for management to take those seriously because right. Uh, development plans that don't have follow through, that management has checked a box and put to the side. Um, that's discouraging to millennials or really anyone. Um, but it does. It, it's, 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 a, it's another job on top of a job, but it, it is fundamentally important to mm -hmm. sort of maintaining that health of the staff. Right. Yeah, management needs to invest in their people, specifically this one. We offer professional development opportunities. Managers need to be aware of what those are within your agencies and be able to communicate that and advocate for their folks to attend and participate in those types of things. Right. Uh, okay, so we've heard a few examples of um, successful initiatives and ideas, and uh, I want to sort of pivot to what, the, um, what challenges you face um, and what sort of restraints um, are, are placed upon you and how that can sort of hamper the job. I mean, we've talked about um, the importance of focusing on mission and recruiting and, and, and getting uh, young people or new recruits to sort of uh, believe in the mission and explain to them, this is what we do, this is why it's important. Um, but, you know, from one administration to the next, the mission, I mean, the fundamentals will stay the same, but, you know, there's definitely some tweaks. Um, so how do you um, convince people that, um, 
that you know this is still an important work, even if it's you know the changing underneath you. And how do you adjust to you know let's say new budgetary restraints and things like that? Um, you know, so it could, it's been a tough environment for a lot of you guys for a while now. So uh, I don't know. Maybe each of you can speak to how you deal with that, how you try to find stability in uh, sort of those times. You want me to take, sure, take this start. one? <laughs> <laughs> so, so what's happened in the last 10 years? We've had sequestration, budget cuts, um, potential government shutdowns. Uh, so and that's a lot in the news. And um, uh, you know, when it comes to attracting uh, folks to come work for the government, um, it's a little off-putting. You're not sure, you're not, you're not familiar um, with what, how that impacts the, the workplace. And so uh, communicating that and trying to, it's still a pretty stable, it's a pretty stable work to work for the, for the government. Um, and uh, there's a lot of benefits that you don't get on the private sector, um, although we do compete with each other in the, in the public <laughs> sector for, for top talent. Um, but it is, it's uh, um, communicating to the employees. I, I know for, for me, um, when we were having the, ooh, sorry about that, uh, when we were having the uh, potential government shutdowns and we actually executed one, um, you know, communicating to the workforce that, you know, it's okay, this is what happens, um, you know, getting them the resources that they need. Some, some federal employees are working paycheck to paycheck. Um, some are not. Um, we also have our, our, uh, our retirement eligible population. Um, you know, I do know a few, in, at least in our location, decided they were, had enough and decided to go ahead and put in for retirement. Um, so it, it's really hard, but I think it's about communication, about explaining, you know, how it does impact them. Um, and that it's still a great place to work, uh, but every, every time Congress changes, the President changes, uh, you know, we do have new stuff. But we also have good stuff because we have expanding hiring authorities to make it easier to hire folks and bring them in. Um, so we have a cyber acquisition, uh, nuclear, uh, quite, a, quite a list. Even, even our Pathways program has been expanded as well. So, uh, so you have to let them know there's some positives and yeah, there's some challenges, but uh, you know, communication and helping them understand that uh, usually helps them with mm -hmm. making the decision to come to the public sector. Yeah, I'll, I'll go next. I think those challenges are, are big. I think yeah. there's more challenges in the past five years than we've had in a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we just have to adapt, right? I mean, we, right now, based on my center that um, I help manage, we're about federal staff of 250 uh, plus contractors, and we have 50 people who are eligible to retire right now and we have 44 vacancies. So in the next two years, um, we, we are definitely in a very big deficit in terms of staffing. And you know, we don't necessarily have the budget, we don't necessarily have all the authorities we need to hire who we need to, um, to get, so we just have to constantly do that balance of how do we get the new skills, how do we get the right skills um, to fill those gaps, but adjust how we, how we manage those gaps when we can't. And, and I think, you know, it has definitely been hard, and I'm not sure anybody would disagree with that, that, you know, we've got a lot of pressure on us, uh, some internal, I would say sometimes where our agencies are our worst enemy in, in how they interpret some of the administration's uh, and Congress's desires. Um, and, you know, we put roadblocks on ourselves that I'm not sure we always need to, but, you know, we're not always the ones who get to control that. So I think we just have to work within the system and really take advantage of some of those new authorities and the, and the new directions that um, the folks above us always want to go. So within DOI, which USGS is part of, Department of Interior, you know, we really have a strong youth program. We're really trying to bring in youth to all of the different bureaus within Department of Interior, not just the science side, but our land resource agencies. You know, that's one way to kind of fill some of that gap you know, focus on things that we can control, like training and recruitment and getting the word out of who we are. You know, even if we can't fill every position that we need to, we need to do a better job of balancing that. Um, you know, and I think we have been successful in bringing in a lot of younger professionals and students, but, you know, we have a gap in middle management right now within, within USGS, but I think within the federal agencies, um, because we weren't able to hire for so long. And that is something that I think we're going to struggle with, and we've got to build, you know, those younger professionals. And, 
you know, those opportunities are there if they want to stay. But again, I think I said it before, the challenge is how to get them to stay, how to sell your mission, how to really um, kind of adapt to who they are and, mm -hmm. and how they work. And I think we're all struggling to do that, but I think we can find success in there as well. So as part of that, uh, when you, are, you have major gaps and limited resources prioritization and, and really finding the most critical gaps and saying we need to focus on these first and then you know, we can backfill the rest when, if and when we can. Yeah, and we, and we do that within my leadership team. You know, we definitely do that uh, as often as we need. You know, almost monthly we're reviewing what positions we have vacant, what we're allowed to hire, what kind of hurdles do we have to go through to actually be approved to hire. Um, I'm sure all the agencies you know, know you can't really determine who you hire all the time. <laughs> You have to get approvals at certain levels. They're different for every agency, but you know we're always reprioritizing. Mm -hmm. And you know sometimes we need to fill the most critical positions, and then we've got to figure out other ways to bring people in, whether it's volunteers, whether it's students. Um, however, we can sort of get those new skills in. You have anything to add, Justin, on that? Um, I think just to address sort of the middle management issue, which mm -hmm. I think is prevalent across a lot of agencies. Um, you know, from my own experience in talking to other folks. Um, the way that job descriptions are written on USA Jobs are very subject heavy specific. So if you don't have that subject matter expertise, um, you're not going to get past the cert. And for a lot of those jobs, the, the real thing you're bringing to the table is your transferable leadership management skills, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm never going to get an opportunity to interview because I can't get past the cert because I don't have specific subject matter expertise in that area. Um, you know, in the private sector, you know, it, that's not, not a hurdle, but it's a specific government thing. But I think that's a big issue that if it could be addressed, you could get a lot more folks moving cross agencies at that middle level um, where they can bring those leadership and management skills. Um, and, and, you know, you can learn that subject matter, right? I mean, it's, it's, a lot of it is just, a, you know, takes a little bit of time. Um, but that's a hurdle that I've seen a lot. And, and I, I don't know that it's really been addressed, but I think it should be an issue that gets looked at. Um, I have a few more questions here, but I do want to leave some time for the audience. So if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to raise your hand. And uh, we got one right here. There's a mic coming around, I think. First of all, I want to thank all of you. You've really given us some good insights. You talked about millennials, and I'm going to now focus on the training side. And we know that you know, some of the key drivers you spoke about, but we know one of those is participation in management meetings to be able to sit in, understand where you're going. But the other one is professional development. So when we look at millennials, and then I'll talk about high potentials in a moment, do you see a preference? We've got the budgetary challenges and constraints. Do you see a preference in the way training is delivered? In other words, are they, do you see the tendencies towards shorter term, online, blended solutions? Where do you see that play out with the millennials, let alone high potentials? I will tell you, at least for us, uh, for the Air Force, we have uh, several different professional development opportunities. And they vary um, whether they're online, in person, long term, short term. Um, but some of the um, more, more um, leadership uh, professional development courses, we have one that you are in residence for one year. So when a manager has someone that would benefit from that and that would bring that skill set back to the organization, it's very challenging to make a decision to let someone go, especially if they're a one deep position or they don't have someone who can take on the responsibilities during their absence. So I think um, a blended, uh, we do have some others that are a blended where you go for in residence for a week or two, but you come back and you go every couple of months and that's over a period of time. Um, so I think right now, um, due to the hiring freeze impacts where we have more vacancies than we want, I think right now the, uh, the feeling is it's very difficult to release someone to go take advantage of that because you need the mission to be accomplished. So, um, you know, when you have very few vacancies, it's very easy to let folks go take on those opportunities. So that's, that's still a challenge, but I think a blended 
uh, option is probably where there's it's more attractive because you you release them for a short period of time and then there's an online piece where they can do it um, uh, local and still accomplish their job although you do still have to manage time and give them the time to to do that professional development and be successful obviously you don't want to hinder their ability to uh, complete the the program I would say, I mean, that's a very good question. I'm not sure we probably have all the answers, but I would say blended. Um, I do, from the experiences that I've heard from our staff, uh, especially the millennials, is, is they do like that in-person training because they, not just the training, but they get to network, right? And when you're at that stage in your career, especially the younger stages, you know, network is, is very important. We all have a network and we got that from meeting people at different events, right? Whether it's within the agencies or not. So I do think blended is good. Online, you know, gets it sort of what they need right away. But I think it's still important for us to focus and budget for uh, in-person training. And, and I'd say think, think entrepreneurially. Um, we've set up different um, working groups within our office that say we have a problem but no one has time to tackle it. Um, you know, does anybody interested in getting together, um, you know, four hours a week and talking about it, you know, how we can address it and different things. Like we, we formed a group which was across the country to address um, onboarding and orientation because we didn't have a program at all. It was, you know, you're here, you sign the papers, you start your job. Well, you know, if you're new to federal government, there's a lot of things you should probably know about and, and how things work. Um, so we put together through that group a bunch of just, you know, rough documents that could at least be a starting point uh, for somebody that comes on board. Um, you know, those types of groups, or even a group like that, but a, a subject area that maybe hasn't gotten addressed and you want some fresh ideas. How can we approach this better, be more efficient? And as long as you can get that middle management to buy in and say, yeah, you can have my person for, you know, a few hours a week outside of their normal duties, um, you know, that's pretty much the buy-in that you would need. But, and that doesn't cost you necessarily any, any financial resources. Um, I think I saw a couple of their hands. Thank you all so much for your insights. You all have spoken a lot about your strategies for attracting and retaining millennials. Would your strategy change for Generation Z, the newest generation entering the workforce now, those that were born after 2001? <laughs> um, it, <laughs> I think it'll, it'll, it'll still be, um, it'll still be a lot of social media uh, type, uh, I still think it will be more of a blended situation where you have the social media contacts, but then still the personal. Um, I, I don't know the answer to that one just yet. All I know is that the social media contacts have, have been working very well, at least for us, um, and I think for you too. Um, and, and that kind of strategy um, has, been, has been very helpful. Um, but I don't know. That's, I mean, that's a good question on what it will look like in the future. Uh, for me, I mean, I'm not Generation Z, obviously, but, um, but for me, um, you can't remove the personnel piece um, and the face-to-face -face and the communication. Um, and I think we need to encourage more of that because, you know, their faces in the phone um, all the time and not interacting with the world around them. So it's going to be a challenge for sure, um, but I, I still think we're, there's still going to be that human, human factor to, to hiring those folks and attracting those folks. I liked what you said in the beginning about um, explaining to people who aren't familiar with government, this is how it works. I, mm -hmm. Just anecdotally, um, you know, I feel like people, they sort of dismiss, their, sometimes they're like, oh, it's so complicated. I don't even want to bother. USA Jobs, how does it even work? And, you know, good people get lost, I think, because of that. Yeah. Um, and uh, by the way, I didn't, is Gen Z already entering the workforce? That makes me feel old. <laughs> <laughs> Some are high. Yeah. <laughs> they are. Oh, my nephew just entered. <laughs> and he did onboarding and he did it all by himself. So it's, 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 it's possible. moving with them. It's possible, but, but it is true. You still lose people because they're, they're having to do it, but the, with the automation and the online application process, there's improvements happening in there. He just did the onboarding all by himself without my help. And um, so that's, that's pretty exciting, but uh, it's, still, it's still not perfect, but I think we're yeah. moving in the right direction. Uh, okay, I think we have time for one more question. Uh. Okay, I'll take you up on that. <laughs> um, so, some millennials have 
run nonprofits. They've, they've done amazing work before they ever got to government. And in fact, the grad school has worked with a group uh, called Young Government Leaders, which is mainly in DC. So my question to you is, um, are they all sheep dipped? Or do you recognize that some people come in with certain, uh, they may have more emotional intelligence, they've actually planned and executed things. And uh, because I, I, the, the retention issue would seem to me to be different with those people mm -hmm. than the other people. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's pretty obvious. I mean, even if the system doesn't allow some of those skills to show up you know, on a USA Jobs resume, I think when you get an interview and you get them in the door, I think those skills and that um, sort of maturity of the workforce shows up. And I, I mean, I think it's in our best interest to definitely capitalize on that, right? I think that is a mistake if we do not. Um, and I'm sure, you know, we all can miss that. Uh, but yeah, we definitely want to build off of those experiences and those skills, um, depending on what role they have or what future role we think they can go into in, in the organization. But I agree. I mean, I think we need to not assume that they don't have any skills, uh, but we also want to make sure we're growing the right skills for our organization and our mission. And do you find that any of the middle managers are blocking that? In I, other words, you little kid have to pay the same dues I pay. I, 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 I will say that, uh, yes, I, I would say yes, we have some of that. I've seen some of that. Um, but that is something that, as management, we try to avoid, right? We try to find those people, and, not the middle managers, but you know, our younger workforce, and, and really try to grow those skills, even if sometimes their supervisor or their management chain isn't as supportive. Um, I think as an organization, we've got to pay attention to that. Um, but yeah, I mean, that happens everywhere. We, we see it in some career fields. Um, where, where you have more of the older generation and the new, and sometimes there's the, the, the difference is right. there. So we still experience it, but um, again, you know, uh, it's about communicating with your managers to s show them the benefits of bringing in the fresh skill set and the different ideas and experiences in there. So uh, HR people are important to help their managers with that. So, uh, you know, communication or even if you're a, a manager, just uh, recognizing that it's not it's not how it used to be it's it's something new and it's a little scary for some managers for sure and one thing to pick up on that you mentioned young government leaders so uh, I'm president of Colorado government leaders which is basically the affiliate uh, an affiliate of young government leaders um, and uh, we do social networking leadership and those types of different types of events um, but frankly it's really hard to get um, folks to come out to events um, and so we try to spread the word through the CFEB um, newsletter. Um, but if anybody here is uh, interested in passing that on to their uh, staff or agency, you can find us on Facebook under Colorado Government Leaders. Um, but it is set up to try to provide some of that networking and some of that um, you know, leadership development um, that we've been talking about today. Great. So everybody should do that. Go to this Facebook page. Um, and we're, we're uh, just out of time, actually. So. I want to thank again the panelists for being here. I think that was a really great conversation. Thank you, everybody, for being here.